As Sarah spoke, to prove that she and Finn were indeed a couple, she even hugged Finn's arm and took the initiative to kiss him. Finn's eyes flickered, but he did not refuse. Monica just stared at them. Could the little bit of hope that had just been ignited be destroyed in an instant? The guard stared intently at them. However, Finn did not look at him. He only turned to look at Sarah and said in a serious tone, Sarah, thank you for accompanying me all this time. Thank you for being so magnanimous as to let me witness Monica's wedding. I finally know that I don't like Monica as much as I thought I did. It was probably a knot in my heart, one that was very difficult to untie. Only when I faced this knot head-on did I realize that it was actually very easy to untie. From now on, I'll let go of Monica and be with you. The sudden and affectionate confession confirmed their relationship. Monica was not far away, listening to every word Finn said. It was rare for Finn to confess in front of so many people. She should celebrate. Celebrate the fact they had turned Finn into another man and then personally hand him over to another woman. Her eyes were a little red, and her cheeks rosy. Fortunately, she did not get too excited and blurted out all the words she had hidden in her heart. If she had said it out loud, she would lose face, would she not? Now, she could at least put on a pretense. Even if she regretted it, she did not love Finn so much that she would do such a stupid thing. In the eyes of outsiders, she should still love Michael more, as it was because of love she would do so many things. That was the name of the game. She tried to silence her thoughts and forced herself to smile. It had indeed just been wishful thinking. If Finn really still had feelings for her, he would have come to take her away from the wedding ceremony when she had torn Michael apart. When he saw how much of a scumbag Michael was, he could not have helped but come to save her. However, she had not even seen Finn once throughout the wedding. Perhaps when he realized that he no longer had feelings for her and saw how bad Michael was, he was secretly happy. She stayed silent as a tear fell onto the back of her hand. In that instant, she concealed it. She did not want to seem as though she was having much of an emotional reaction. At the scene, due to the first man's resistance in Finn's incident, the entire banquet hall was in an uproar. Who are you to not believe him? Everyone in the country knows about what happened between Finn and Monica. Now, you're accusing Finn of groundless crimes. What makes you think you can do whatever you want? You can search us, but at least take us all to the police station and let the whole country know that we are guilty. Then, I will accept your investigation. If you don't give us a reasonable explanation, even if I die here today, shot dead by that so-called spy, I won't let you touch a single part of my body. There were more and more sounds of resistance as more and more people started to get agitated. The scene became chaotic. Everyone was protesting against their human rights being violated when a figure from the Sanders, who had not shown their faces since the start, suddenly appeared on the banquet stage. It was not the leader. Instead, the young master of the Sanders, Chester. He was the most popular candidate to be the Sanders' next heir, and his appearance represented the leader himself to a large extent. As soon as he opened his mouth, the entire place fell silent. Everyone's attention was on him. He said, I'm very sorry for the inconvenience caused. It was not my intention to use this method to embarrass everyone. As a member of the Sanders, I would like to express my deepest apologies for the suffering caused to everyone today. He bowed deeply to everyone present. He had to use the Sanders sincerity to move everyone at the banquet, as they could not completely offend these people. Since they had already done so much, they could not give up halfway. They could only use this method to let everyone understand the Sanders forced actions. After Chester finished bowing, he stood up straight and said to everyone, 
We received news that a spy was among the guests of the wedding banquet and had been sent to assassinate my father. My father had originally planned to attend Michael's wedding banquet but turned back halfway. He did not want to disturb the guests and decided to secretly investigate this person. However, he was too cunning and brushed past us several times. Thus, we had no choice but to treat everyone this way. Though it was impossible for everyone to calm down just by Chester's few words. Naturally, Chester was well aware of this as well. He added, of course, I know many of you here are not the spy. However, for the sake of fairness, we investigated everyone. The purpose was to avoid wrongfully suspecting anyone and causing greater harm to that person. Hence, we chose to do it in a fair and just manner. I didn't think such a move would cause such a large amount of disgust on the scene. I apologized to everyone. It was another sincere apology, and it made everyone at the scene more at ease. After all, Chester was a member of the Sanders, and Harkin was still under their rule. Chester's status could also be said to be the most respected among these people. However, he apologized to everyone time and time again. No matter how impressive one's status was, under Chester's humble attitude, they would not dare to be rash again. The result of their impetuousness confirmed that they had not taken the sander seriously, and no one present could afford to bear such a crime. When Chester saw that everyone in the hall had calmed down, he did not immediately order his men to continue searching. Instead, he waved his hand and gestured for a guard to approach him. He said, it was the Sanders' fault for not handling the matter properly. It was supposed to be a fair and just method, but the Sanders were excluded from the search. Now, the Sanders will undergo the same inspection as everyone else. Guards, please do a corresponding check on the Sanders first. The guard saluted Chester respectfully before stepping forward. In front of all the guests, they conducted a full body search on Chester. At the same time, they also conducted a full body search on the rest of the Sanders. Since the Sanders had taken the lead in allowing themselves to be inspected, if the others continued to cause trouble, they would really be thinking too highly of themselves. It had to be said that the Sanders' actions had effectively resolved the stalemate in the wedding banquet hall and had saved their reputation. Knox and Edward looked at each other, the two of them waiting silently. After the Sanders were searched and their hair was cut off to confirm their identity through DNA, the guards began to carry out the investigation work that had not been successful just now. Because of the Sanders' leading role, all the guests no longer rejected the examination. The guard that was facing Finn was still in a deadlock with him. It was not until another guard walked over and said something in his ear that the guard left Finn's side and began the next search. Finn secretly heaved a sigh of relief. The Sanders knew that everyone was in a bad mood. If they insisted on taking him away, it would definitely cause even greater chaos. The Sanders would not be able to hold their ground, and all they had done just now would be for naught. So, they could only let Finn go temporarily. Finn could not help but glance at Edward and Knox, who were not far away. If this continued, Alex would be discovered very soon. Edward and Knox also seemed to have received Finn's gaze, but though they hid their emotions so well that even Jean could not tell either. Her attention had been on the three of them since the beginning. In fact, most of the attention of the Hills and the Sanders had been on the three of them. They hoped to get information from them, but the three of them had revealed nothing. They did not look anywhere else. Therefore, it was impossible to tell who the descendant of the Duncans was. In the quiet wedding venue, everything was proceeding in an orderly manner. Jean was starting to get suspicious that there really was no sign of Alex. However, it would mean everything they had done was in vain. It was just a trick by Edward. Otherwise, how could Edward be so calm? Though... She pursed her lips. 
There seemed to be some obvious signs between his legs. How could he be in the mood to do such a thing in this situation? The inspection was halfway done. At that moment, everyone probably had the same thoughts as Jean. In the wedding hall, the lights were suddenly extinguished. Before anyone could react, intense gunshots were heard in the darkness. The gunshots instantly threw the entire scene into chaos, and screams of fear rang out continuously. The scene was completely out of control. Don't move, everyone. Be quiet. One of the Sanders guards said loudly, we will ensure everyone's safety. Everyone, don't move. However, it did not make anyone quiet down. People were shuttling through the banquet hall, and some were screaming and crying. They were uncontrollable in the darkness. The guards of the Sanders did not dare to shoot rashly and would only stand position to protect everyone. One by one, the guards at the entrance of the wedding banquet hall fell under the gunfire. The doors of the wedding banquet hall opened. When everyone saw the light, they started to rush out without a care for their lives. Everyone, don't leave. Keep quiet, and don't move. The guards had been preventing everyone from leaving. The hall was filled with heart-wrenching wails. There were screams everywhere because of the guards' obstruction. It was utter chaos. At this moment, the assassins of the hills also took action. They only had one target, Edward. As soon as the lights turned dark, Jean immediately went in Edward's direction. She saw him leave quickly in the dark, and Jean could only follow her instincts as to where he was. Amid the chaotic crowd, she struggled to keep up. However, she could still see Edward's figure. Perhaps it was someone similar. After all, he had clearly disappeared from her sight. It was due to that feeling. The feeling of him walking past her that she had recognized Edward's existence in the dark. At that moment, she finally understood why Edward could recognize her immediately. Sometimes, it really was not the eyes that determined a person but the heart. She gritted her teeth, reached out, and grabbed him. It had not been Edward, but the person Edward was protecting in the dark and currently leading out. This explained why Edward, who had disappeared in front of her, suddenly appeared behind her. It was obvious he had gone back to save her, and the person he was protecting was the Duncan's descendant. Jean had just grabbed the man's arm when she felt a sharp pain in her wrist. The strong force made her instantly let go. She could only watch as the man whom she had finally touched for a second left her grasp. She stared straight at the figure and watched as he quickly left the banquet hall and followed the crowd to the exit. While it was dark inside the wedding banquet hall, daylight still shone outside. As long as the light outside shone on the man once he walked out the door, she would be able to see who he was. Even if it was just a back view, one could be sure who it was. Just as the truth was about to surface, she was suddenly shackled in someone's arms. He even used a lot of brute force to bury her face in his chest, making her unable to see anything in front of her. Jean resisted with all her might, but it was to no avail. She was firmly trapped by Edward and could not move. She gritted her teeth and aimed the black muzzle of the gun in her hand directly at his abdomen. This was the weapon she always carried with her. Even when she had been intimate with Edward, he would strip her of her clothes but never her weapon. She said, I swear I'll shoot. Edward could feel her determination. I know. Edward said, above her head, but I have no other choice. Jean's body trembled uncontrollably. She only needed to kill Edward with one shot to find out who the descendant of the Duncans was. As long as she fired the shot, she would know. However, her trembling fingers could not bear to pull the trigger. Suddenly, a gunshot rang out and landed on Edward. Jean's heart skipped a beat. 
She was even a little flustered. She did not fire her weapon. So who was the one who shot Edward? Before she had time to collect her thoughts, Edward was already rolling on the ground with Jean in his arms and buried her face in his chest. She used all her strength but still could not break free. Edward. Jean sounded anxious. She did not know where Edward had been hurt. She did not know. I'm not going to die. He said right beside her ear. As he spoke, he brought her to a corner of the banquet and hid. Where are you hurt? Jean asked him loudly. As she was trapped by him, she had no idea where the bullet had hit him. There was unconcealable worry in her tone. Let me go. Jean said. Edward twisted his body and said fiercely, If I let go, you won't go looking, right? I promise, Jean replied. Edward released her, trusting her. However, the moment he let go, Jean got up from Edward's side to chase after him. Since she was delayed for some time, that person must have already gotten out. However, as long as she chased after him and checked the time, she might be able to find him. The moment she stood up, her body was suddenly pulled back. F asterisk CK Jean gritted her teeth. I knew you wouldn't be so honest. Edward even laughed. Even in the dark, his smile could be clearly felt. Jean glared at Edward. He had just been testing her. As he could guarantee that she would not be able to escape, he deliberately tested her. Between them, who was more cunning? In the dark wedding hall, the screams continued. Everyone was fleeing outside, and there was chaos everywhere. The Sanders guards did not dare to act rashly. They maintained the sound of the scene, which was of no use in the current situation since it was all out of control. Edward dragged Jean to a dark corner. Edward, who had a gunshot wound on his leg, sat on the ground, pulling Jean into his arms. She struggled but could not break free from his brutality. The difference in strength between her and Edward was frightening. Jean gritted her teeth. She really wanted to shoot this man to death. However, she could not bring herself to do it. She failed each time she tried. She was so angry that her body trembled. It feels like you're about to smoke from anger. Edward's playful voice sounded beside her ear. Jean said nothing. She was afraid that she would not be able to resist strangling him to death once she opened her mouth. She wanted to know the truth, and it was right in front of her eyes, within her reach. Besides the mission, she was also very curious about who the descendant of the Duncans was. Who was it that could play the Sanders like fools and hearken? Yet, just like that, Edward stopped her. She gritted her teeth in hatred. Stay me for a while. Edward suddenly hugged her tighter. Even though she was still trapped in Edward's arms, she seemed to have a different emotion. Jean's heart throbbed as she recalled the two of them in the cloakroom just now. This man's touch left a deep feeling within her body. She said, let me go. I did, and you ran away. He hugged her tightly and buried his head in her neck. His warm breath on her body made her skin grow hot, and her body was covered with goosebumps at his proximity. She bit her lip lightly. A mature body was always so easily seduced. Jean desperately wanted to reject his intimacy, but her body's instinctive reaction was so obvious that even she was afraid. She grabbed Edward's unruly hand. Edward! Jean bellowed. What do you think you're doing? He was still so dishonest. Edward chuckled after being lectured by Jean. Sorry. I can't help it. Cannot help it, my asterisk SS. Jean said, 10 minutes. You better behave yourself. After all, she did agree to accompany him for a while. 
Soon, ten minutes had passed. The corner of Edward's mouth, which was buried in her neck, seemed to smile. She wondered if this would leave bitterness in her heart. Even though they were clearly husband and wife and had been apart for more than a month, they could only spend ten minutes together. The two of them hugged each other deeply. Everything around them seemed to disappear. For those ten minutes, they had each other. The lights in the banquet hall were still not turned on. Occasionally, there would be a few gunshots, but no one was hurt. They were just deliberately causing chaos at the banquet. The Sanders seemed to have given up on keeping everyone inside. Besides, they could not keep them from leaving. In order to save their lives, all the guests instinctively wanted to leave. If the Sanders tried to stop them now, it would prove that the Sanders were barbaric and cruel. In the end, they could only let this matter go to waste. The Sanders were also well aware it was the other party's intention in this incident to cause chaos so that the descendant of the Duncans could escape without hurting anyone. Only a few guards at the door died at the scene. The rest of the time, the guns were aimed at the sky. When the chaos simmered down, at least 50% of the guests had fled. The guards had also completely given up on all obstructions. The moment the Sanders swallowed all their emotions and decided to let everyone go, the banquet hall suddenly caught on fire. The scream grew louder. Fire! Fire! Everyone, get out of here! The guards had already started to help the guests out, but the fire came a little quickly. In an instant, the entire banquet hall was engulfed in a sea of fire. Jean pushed Edward away. Let's go. Edward looked at Jean. Do you want to die? Let's go. Jean said. She did not expect the place to suddenly burn up in flames. Edward said, you go first. What else do you want to do? Jean stared at Edward. Now, because of the fire, they could see each other clearly. Edward did not speak. Edward. Jean glared fiercely at him. If they didn't leave now, they would have to prepare to be burned to death inside. Just as Jean was about to flare up, Edward suddenly lowered her head and kissed her deeply. F asterisk CK. Edward was crazy for doing such a thing at a time like this. Jean pushed Edward away, but he bit her lip, staining them with blood. Then, he stood up and rushed into the burning banquet hall. Jean looked at Edward's back. Her eyes turned red. What was he going to do? Was he really going to risk his life like that? She knew then that this fire was not an accident. It was a deliberate arrangement and the reason why Edward asked her to accompany him was to stall for time. It was clear he played her. Jean's vision was blurry as she watched his figure disappear. Retreat. A familiar voice suddenly rang in Jean's ears. She turned her head and saw Lucy, who seemed to have found her under the light of the fire. She pulled her by the arm and walked out. Jean returned to her senses. Edward was no longer in her line of sight, and the fire inside was clearly getting bigger and bigger. The guards were also transporting all the guests away in the light of the fire. Jean gritted her teeth and decided to leave with Lucy. As they retreated, she suddenly thought of something. What's wrong? Lucy noticed her expression. I don't know if George and Monica have gone out. Jean was obviously nervous. She knew very well that there would be no casualties in the chaos. The other party obviously did not want to kill anyone, and since the guards of the Sanders could not do anything to the guests, there was no immediate danger. However, with the current fire, people could die if they were not careful. George left. Lucy kept saying. She had specifically asked someone to pay special attention to George. 
They would try their best not to implicate George in this incident. He was brought out by Knox at the first moment. As for Monica, Lucy did not notice. Help me ask the others if they saw the bride leave. Jean said to Lucy anxiously. Lucy nodded. She was well aware of Monica's importance to Jean and would not force Jean on this matter. So while Lucy informed everyone to evacuate, she also ordered them to search if Monica had already left the banquet hall. As the fire inside grew more and more intense, Lucy forced Jean to leave. It was easy to get burned inside. Jean followed Lucy out, but she did not move very fast. If someone discovered that Monica was still inside, she could rush back and save her. The two of them walked to the entrance of the banquet hall. Most of the guests had already escaped, and Jean was constantly looking for Monica's figure among them. Then, Michael walked past Jean and out of the banquet hall with Reese by his side. Reese seemed to be choking and coughing on the smoke, and Michael was taking care of her. Jean glanced at the two of them, a little nervous. Monica, like Michael, was at the innermost part of the banquet hall. It was quite far from the main doors and was the most difficult to exit. She felt that she could not wait any longer. She was going to rush in. Jean! Lucy pulled her back. Calm down. Monica's different. She's very stupid, doesn't know anything, and her stamina's horrible. Jean was almost certain that Monica was still inside. She's different from Edward. If Edward rushed in, he still had a chance of survival. However, Monica won't. She would easily be burned to death by the fire. Lucy bit her lip. At this moment, Kingsley was constantly instructing her, take Jean and leave immediately. She looked at Jean intently, but Jean did not seem to want to talk to Lucy anymore. She shook off Lucy's hand and rushed in. Lucy! Kingsley's voice rang in her ears. When she saw Jean rush into the banquet hall, she shouted in an unusually angry voice. It was true. She could stop Jean. After all, Jean's skills were no match for hers. If they really fought, Jean would not be able to win. However, she disobeyed Kingsley's orders and rushed in with Jean. The moment Jean ran in, she brushed past Finn as he carried Sarah out, her body leaning weakly against Finn's chest. It was unclear whether she was injured or just too frightened. Her body kept trembling as she clutched Finn's clothes tightly. Sarah probably did not expect so many things to happen at a wedding and that she would be so close to dying here. Her eyes were red. Finally, with Finn's help, she walked out. Finn had disappeared from her side the moment the lights went dark. She did not know where he had gone, and she was frightened and panicked. She wanted to run out with the crowd. However, there were so many people, and the screams were endless. She was knocked to the ground several times and nearly trampled to death. So, she simply hid beside the table and waited until there were fewer people to leave. To be honest, she was only waiting for Finn. Her first instinct had been to run for her life. However, once she calmed down, she thought about how Finn was still inside and how he would not just leave her behind. He was not that kind of person. While people were fleeing, her parents dragged her along, but she let them go first. She told them she had sprained her ankle and would come out when there were fewer people. Sarah was waiting for Finn inside. Now, there were fewer and fewer people around her, but Finn still had not returned. Perhaps Finn had really left on his own. Sarah was a little upset. She thought that Finn's confession was true. Maybe it had been for. She had no idea, but Finn had been acting really weird today. It was like she did not know who he was anymore. 
She rose from the darkness and was about to leave when the hall suddenly caught fire. It was fierce, and the entire banquet hall was instantly engulfed in flames. She could not stop coughing due to the smoke. Through the firelight, she could see that her cousin's family had just left the banquet hall. They had probably been in the same dilemma as her. As they were all seated at the innermost part of the banquet hall, they were far from the exit, and it was tough to get out. On the other hand, with her cousin's reception dress being so complicated and the skirt so long, there was no way she could not walk out amid the chaos. Not even a step. She would only get hurt in the crowd if she tried. It was probably because there were fewer people that the family walked out of the banquet hall. However, they had only taken a few steps when they were suddenly surrounded by fire. Everyone was shocked. The remaining people in the banquet hall, frightened by the fire, frantically ran out, as did Monica and her parents. Monica's skirt and high heels already made it difficult for her to walk. Now, she was walking very fast. It only took for someone to accidentally brush past her, which caused her to fall to the ground. She thought she was about to fall to her death, and everything in front of her was blurry for a while. Gary and Ruby quickly knelt down. Monica, are you alright? Monica endured the pain. She held back her tears and tried her best to get up. She said, it's nothing. Let's hurry and leave. Gary and Ruby did not dare to delay. They helped Monica up and hurried out. They were halfway through the banquet hall when the ribbons, flowers, and dry grass used to make the banquet even more beautiful fell onto the ground. Ah! The remaining people at the scene all started to scream. Some of the decorations had even fallen onto the guests, and they instantly caught on fire. Fortunately, there were still guards in the banquet hall escorting the guests. A few guards quickly used their clothes to extinguish the flames on the guests and sent them out as quickly as possible. However, they had limited manpower, meaning not everyone was able to get support. It all depended on luck. The fire inside was getting bigger and bigger. It was getting harder for them to leave. Auntie! Sarah suddenly called out as she walked behind them. She had wanted to leave with them. However, she did not expect there to be so much fire. Her skin had been scalded by fire debris fallen on her, and her dress was on fire. Ruby heard Sarah's voice and quickly turned around to see her niece still in the hall as well. She hurried over, patting the sparks off her body. Gary also took off his suit jacket and did the same. Finally, the fire on her body was extinguished, but it had taken some time. The fire around her had grown, and the smoke was even more suffocating now. Auntie! Sarah was frightened. She hugged Ruby and cried her heart out. He had never experienced anything like this before. This was the first time she felt despair. Ruby was afraid too. But to reassure Sarah and Monica, she could only comfort them and say, let's get out quickly. The group hurried out, with Gary supporting Ruby while Monica and Sarah held hands. Their footsteps were quick. The air inside was thinning, the smoke was getting thicker, and fire debris kept falling from above. Ah! Monica and Sarah suddenly sat on the ground. Huge fire debris had fallen from the sky, and they moved back to avoid it, causing the two of them to fall to the ground uncontrollably. Gary and Ruby had been walking ahead of them. When they heard the sound, they quickly turned around. You guys go first. Monica and Sarah were now blocked by the flames, making it difficult for them to escape. Monica! Gary rushed back to save her without thinking. Monica said loudly, Dad, head out with Mom first. I can't leave this way, so I'll use the other exit. Leave. Quickly. Monica. 
Gary went over towards Monica. Dad, take mom and leave. We can't let our family end here like this. I'll take Xiao Xi out through the other exit. Take good care of mom. Monica said loudly. She really did not want her father to rush into the fire to save her. Gary's eyes watered. Monica got up from the ground and helped Sarah up. Without giving her parents any chance to hesitate, she ran to the other side. Both Gary and Ruby's eyes turned red. Neither of them could accept that their daughter was still in the fire. Hurry up and leave. Just as the two of them were about to rush in, the guards inside discovered Gary and Ruby's existence and quickly led them out. My daughter and niece are still inside. Please save them. I beg you. Ruby cried when she saw the guards. Gary also kept saying, please go in and save my daughter. She's still inside. Please save her. We'll thank you. We'll thank you. However, the security guards were like robots and could not hear their pleas. They just led them coldly out of the banquet hall, with no chance to go back. Monica and Sarah, who were currently trapped in the wedding banquet hall, struggled with every step. They were surrounded by fire and could not even get to the few exits. The air in the wedding hall was extremely thin, and the smoke was so thick that it had them both choking. Monica and Sarah were both crawling on the ground. They had even taken off their heels, but because of the fire, the soles of their feet were scalded. Sarah cried uncontrollably. Monica, I don't want to die. I don't want to die. Monica did not want to die either. While she had the courage to commit suicide before, now that she was facing death, she was afraid. Monica suppressed the fear in her heart and pulled Sarah to a table. She found a bottle of soda and helped Sarah wet her clothes. Cover your mouth. Don't breathe in too much smoke. Sarah did as she was told, but she could not stop crying. Don't cry. Save your strength. Someone will come and save us. Monica comforted her. Though she was half scared to death and just really wanted to cry, Sarah was her sister. In times of real danger, she could only act as an older figure to protect and comfort her. Sarah looked at Monica eagerly. Monica had no choice but to wet her skirt and cover her mouth and nose with the hem of her skirt. The two of them squatted down due to the sinking air under the fire as Monica calmly observed a way for them to escape. There were three exits in the front, left, and right of them. The right side was blocked, as they had taken it earlier. The front exit was too far away, so it would be impossible to get out that way. They could only go left. However, the flames on the left side seemed to be very big. If this continued, it was very likely that they would be burned alive. She did not expect that her wedding, one she had not anticipated, would end in such a situation. She could not imagine how so many things had happened. Marriage was just a scandal at most. How could so many earth-shattering things happen? If she died, Michael would definitely jump for joy. Was this retribution for exposing Michael? Cousin, I'm so scared. I'm so scared. Sarah watched as the flames got angrier and angrier, with no sign of someone coming in to save them. The wedding banquet hall seemed on the verge of collapsing. Let's go that way. Monica felt that instead of waiting here, where no one could come in to save them, it was better to give herself a chance. Maybe she could find a way out. They covered their mouths with their wet clothes with one hand and held each other's hands with the other. Then, they half squatted and walked out of the door on the left. Ah. Sarah kept screaming. The fire debris above their heads was falling more and more frequently. If they were not careful, they would fall on them. Monica kept walking, 
dragging Sarah with her. Ah! Sarah and Monica were suddenly hit hard by fire debris. The two of them let go of each other's hands, patting off the sparks on their bodies. Fortunately, as their clothes were wet from the soda, the fire could not ignite. The two of them rolled on the ground until the fire was extinguished. Monica's body was in an even sorrier state now. She gritted her teeth and got up from the ground, even though she was already starting to despair. After all, with such a big fire, it was impossible to get out. The people outside could no longer enter either. However, she still wanted to give herself a glimmer of hope. Just in case a miracle happened. She finally got up from the ground to help Sarah. Sarah, who was also covered in wounds, was almost out of breath from crying. She probably really thought she was going to die. When Monica went over, she saw a figure appear through the flames. He was also drenched, probably from soda water. He had a large coat on, and some sparks were burning on it. He walked over and seemed to glance at her. Then, he squatted down and picked Sarah up. Before he left, he threw the coat at her. Monica's eyes were still red, and her vision was blurry. Had Finn come back to save? Sarah. Should she be grateful that he had at least been kind enough to give her a coat? Her skin was now red from the heat of the wedding hall. There were even many blisters from burns, which looked very scary. Though, she had nothing to fuss about. She did not have a relationship with Finn anymore, so it was only natural that he saved Sarah. She crawled over and put on the coat that Finn had thrown at her. Then, she tried her best to walk out. She kept telling herself that she could not give up. If she did not give up, there might still be a trace of hope. She walked on for a long time. However, it seemed that no matter how hard she tried, she could not reach the exit. Even her breathing had become weaker. She did not think she was going to make it. She laid on the ground, tears falling from her eyes. She did not want to die. She really did not want to die. She bit her lip and watched helplessly as a huge piece of fire debris fell from above, about to burn her body. She closed her eyes and chose to accept death. Suddenly, her body was pulled up from the ground. Then, she rolled a few times to avoid the fire that was falling from above. She looked up at the person in front of her. Don't fall asleep. She said. The voice was very familiar, as was the face. Monica just stared at the person in front of her. There were several times when she nearly fell unconscious, but she forced herself to stay awake. I'll bring you out. Jean carried Monica up from the ground. Fortunately, Monica still had a coat on her. At the very least, the flames did not burn her skin when she shuttled through the fire. Monica tightly hugged Jean's neck. This way. Lucy was clearing the way for Jean. Jean had not noticed that Lucy had followed her into the room, but she did not have time for words. The two of them worked together and rushed out of the banquet hall in the shortest time possible. At that moment, a figure walked past them, seeming like an illusion. After all, everyone's only thought was to escape in moments like these. After that figure rushed in, he suddenly rushed out again. He looked straight at the few figures in front of him. It was as if he had seen them clearly before he turned around and walked to the other side. Jean and Lucy placed Monica in the ambulance. As many people had been burned due to the fire, the Sanders arranged for ambulances to carry out the rescue. It was also at this moment that mighty fire trucks appeared in the wedding hall and began to put out the fire frantically. Monica grabbed Jean, who was about to leave after putting her down. She said softly, Jean. Jean's heart skipped a beat and had a lump in her throat. Monica still recognized her. 
Was it because of familiarity, or was she who Monica wanted to see? Either way, she still recognized her no matter what she looked like. I don't want you to go, Monica said with tears falling from the corners of her eyes. She was too weak and could not open her eyes. Jean's eyes watered. She was speechless. Lucy looked at them and wanted to urge them several times, but she held back. When the doctors and nurses in the ambulance covered Monica with an oxygen mask, Jean pushed Monica's hand away. Monica did not have much strength, but she could see the tears in the corners of her eyes, flowing even more clearly now. Jean said, take good care of yourself. She could not make any promises to Monica, only that she learned to take care of herself. She got out of Monica's ambulance and watched as the ambulance door closed and left. She turned around, needing a moment to recover her emotions. Let's go, she said. George, Lucy suddenly said. Jean's eyes flickered. She looked in Lucy's direction and saw little George standing not far away from her. He just stared and did not approach her. Even though his eyes were filled with anticipation that she would pass, he held it in and did not say anything. He only looked at her silently. Jean's emotions, which she had been suppressing, suddenly fluctuated. She knew that one day, she would abandon George. However, she had always thought that it would be the day she died, never intentionally. When she turned around, George's calm little face still showed a little discomfort, and his big eyes began to turn red. He was clearly reluctant, but he bit his lip and did not say a word. His small action moved even Knox, who was at his side. He had originally planned to give George a blow, saying his mother did not want him. Now that he had been touched by this little brat, he felt a little uncomfortable. Jean, this cold-blooded woman. She did not even want her husband and son and left just like that. Do you want to leave with George? Lucy asked her. Jean shook her head. She felt safer with George by Edward's side. She and Lucy quickly got into the private car parked outside the banquet hall. Once they got in, the car instantly drove away. George just watched as the car disappeared in front of him. The tears in his eyes were obvious, but he did not cry. Stop looking. Let's go. Knox said in a light tone. He was afraid to agitate George. George only bit his lip. Let's go find your dad. I heard he's injured. Knox deliberately changed the topic. This little wimp made his heart ache for no reason. He was not like other children who would cry and make a scene if things did not meet their requirements. Though, it might be better to cry and make a scene. After all, children should have the nature of children. Knox did not know what George had gone through to be able to endure such things. He stroked George's head as if to comfort him, and George did not refuse his touch. He took the initiative to pull Knox's hand. Knox's heart softened. He had an inexplicable urge to protect George. F asterisk CK. As if George was his son. He led George to the other side and saw Finn supporting Edward as they walked over. Knox sped up with George. He scanned Edward from head to toe. Everything all right. I'm fine, Edward said. Then, he added, everything has been burned. It was true. The hair that the guards had collected had all been burned. This was all the preparations they had made in advance. If the Sanders only collected DNA in secret, they would mess with them and switch the DNA. However, if they took the risk and chose to use force, they would create chaos and burn everything they had collected, completely destroying it and leaving them with nothing. Even though he was injured, it was obvious that they had succeeded. The four of them returned to the car and left the scene. 
In the car, Finn was checking on Edward's physical condition. George sat beside him obediently, and Knox sat in the front row, turning to look at them. How is he? Knox asked. Just need to take the bullet out of his leg. The others are like burns. Nothing serious, Finn said. Knox gave a slight nod. By the way, did anyone die today? Knox asked. Other than the few guards we killed, did any of the guests die? Finn did not answer, nor did Edward. It did not really matter to them whether or not anyone died. After all, some things required a certain amount of sacrifice. It did not faze them anymore. Did you guys see Monica? Knox frowned. When they saw Jean, Monica had already been in the ambulance, so they had not seen her. Finn said nothing. I've been waiting for you guys outside. I don't remember seeing Monica. Knox recalled. She couldn't have burned to death inside, right? Knox suddenly felt a little excited. Although, Monica did not deserve to die. Moreover, they had known and dealt with each other for so many years. If she had burned to death because of them, they would definitely feel bad. She's not dead, Finn said. Jean saved her. Knox looked at Finn. How did he know? Before he could question Finn further, the car arrived at Bamboo Garden. Finn immediately changed the topic. Knox, come and help Fourth Master. He saw that George had already taken the initiative to go over and hold Edward's hand. In the car. George held Edward's hand, obviously trying to help him out. Edward looked at George and smiled. He said, I'm not going to die. You always get hurt, though. George's round eyes looked straight at Edward. Edward was speechless. It seems I'm asking too much of you to take care of yourself, George muttered. It's not serious this time. Edward could only reluctantly explain. George blinked his eyes in disbelief. I can be witness to that, Finn said. Knox, who was watching the commotion, came over and helped Edward. It's really not that serious this time. George turned to look at Finn. Knox also deliberately said, even if your dad is dying, I'll take care of you. So don't be afraid that no one will want you. He knew that his father would not take care of him. Edward glared at Knox. He promised George, I'll definitely do what I promised you. George nodded, choosing to believe his words. Edward stroked George's head and did not say much. He would try his best to give him a complete family. He had promised George that he would not only take care of himself but also bring Jean back. Knox helped Edward back to his bed before Finn removed the bullet in Edward, with George accompanying him. It was clearly a bloody scene, but George was not afraid. He stared straight and watched Finn's operation very carefully. Aren't you afraid? Knox could not help but ask George. George turned to look at him. Why should I be? Shouldn't a child be afraid of a bloody mess? No, George replied. I see it often in Delta Island. Knox was speechless. Just what kind of environment did George grow up in? He was clearly weak and had obviously not been trained. Naturally, it made him think that Jean had protected him since he was young. As expected, Jean really was unpredictable. Was she not afraid that her son would go astray? Finn's surgeries usually went quickly and successfully. He removed the bullets and bandaged Edward's wound. Then, he treated the minor burns on his body and put him on an anti-inflammatory drip. After that, he packed his surgery bag. You should recover in about a week, Finn said. It should be peaceful this week too. Edward nodded. The Sanders didn't get anything useful. 
coupled with the fact that they have to appease the people with this incident. They won't act rashly for a while. I hope we can end this quickly, Knox said. My heart itches. It won't be long now, Edward said bluntly. Once the Sanders know of this person's existence, they will not delay. The room suddenly fell silent. It was always quiet before the storm. They had been training since young for this moment. Therefore, there were still some feelings overflowing. Finn. Knox changed the topic, aren't you going to treat your wounds? Finn lowered his head and looked at himself. He did not feel any pain, which made him unaware of where he was injured. Your back and arms are burnt quite badly, Knox reminded him. Finn responded indifferently, okay. Do you need my help? Knox asked. No need. You stay here with Fourth Master. I'll go back to the hospital to deal with it, Finn said. Knox still wanted to say something, but he held his tongue. Finn reminded him, the worst thing to fear every time after an injury is an infection. Knox, help me keep an eye on Fourth Master for any signs of a fever. If he does, let me know immediately. I'm leaving and will only be back later. Go ahead. I'll accompany Fourth Master Swan, Knox said. Finn informed Edward and left Bamboo Garden. Knox looked at Finn's back and said, I bet Finn went to see Monica. Edward glanced at Knox. Knox laughed, looking very proud of himself. I can't help it. I'm just that fiery. Finn drove away from Bamboo Garden. When he returned to the hospital, he went straight to the burn department. There were many patients. As most of the injured at the banquet had been sent here, the VIP ward was at full capacity. So Finn casually went to a general clinic to treat the burns on his body. The doctor suggested that he stay in the hospital as his burns were quite serious. Finn refused, saying he was a doctor and knew his physical condition well. So, the doctor did not say anything else. After Finn had dealt with his burns, he returned to his department, changed into a spare set of clothes, and left to go to the burn department. He went straight to the VIP section and stopped outside a ward. In the ward, Monica was wrapped up like a mummy, with her parents by her side. Mom, don't cry. Monica could not stand it anymore. Her mother had never been so fragile in the past. It's not like I want to. However, I can't help but feel afraid every time I think about how you let your father and I go and how you and Sarah were trapped inside. Your dad and I were so worried when we got out, Ruby said, her tears flowing. Monica could not move at all. There were many burns, but fortunately, they were not too deep. The doctor said they were all superficial wounds and would recover in a week. If there happened to be any marks on the skin later, they could be recovered through cosmetic surgery. In short, one should definitely feel blessed after surviving a disaster. I'm fine, aren't I? Monica consoled. Thank God that you're fine. Otherwise, your dad and I would have died with you. Ruby said angrily. Monica was speechless. She reckoned that her actions this time had indeed frightened her mother. How's Sarah? Monica changed the subject. She really did not want her mother to keep harping on her. In fact, when she asked her parents to leave the burning wedding hall first, she had been prepared to die inside. Naturally, she did not want her parents to die with her. I went over to take a look just now and asked the doctor. Her condition is similar to yours. She's wrapped like a dumpling but not as serious as yours, Ruby said. After all, she came out first. That's right. Sarah had been rescued by Finn first. There was a faint smile on her lips, and not a trace of emotion could be seen. 
She said, that's good. I was afraid something would happen to Sarah. Uncle and auntie would kill me. What are you talking about? Your uncle isn't that unreasonable. You can't win against auntie, Monica exposed her. Say, my child, Ruby was quite protective. They were always good to Sarah's family. All right. I won't say any more. I'd like to rest for a while and sleep. You guys should also lie down for a quick nap on the accompanying beds. Aren't you all tired after what happened today? Monica urged. Gary and Ruby heaved a sigh of relief when they saw Monica in good spirits, and the doctor had said it was only superficial wounds. Afraid of disturbing Monica's rest, the two left her bed and slept on the accompanying bed next to her. Monica closed her eyes and tried her best to fall asleep. She could still picture Finn's determined figure in the fire and Jean leaving. How did Jean change so much all of a sudden how could she move so easily through the fire? It seemed like it was no effort at all for her to carry Monica. Moreover, why did she turn into another person to attend her wedding? Did Jean have something to do with what happened at the wedding? Though, she would not blame Jean. She was just worried about how Jean was living now. What exactly was Jean going through? These thoughts clouded her head. Even though she was extremely sleepy, she could not fall asleep. However, she was so quiet that it made others believe she had fallen asleep. She heard her parents discussing softly on the accompanying bed, I heard that Finn saved Sarah. Yep. I just heard your brother and sister-in-law say that it was Finn who carried Sarah out, Gary sighed. Sarah should have been with Monica then. That means Finn abandoned Monica and saved Sarah first, Ruby also sighed. I can understand. Gary was reasonable. He's dating Sarah now. It's only natural that he saves her first. That's true, but Ruby was more emotional. It did not necessarily mean she would be happier if Monica had been saved first. In her heart, Sarah was as important as Monica. She just had an indescribable feeling in her heart. She felt that Finn had been a little too cold to her daughter and was afraid she would get hurt. Forget it, he said. Gary did not seem to want to delve into this topic. Don't mention this in front of Monica. Since she didn't say anything, there's no need for us to poke at our daughter's wound. I know. Ruby nodded. Get some sleep. You've been through so much today. Have some rest to recuperate. Gary comforted her. Ruby nodded. She leaned into her husband's arm and closed her eyes. Then slowly, the sound of their even breathing could be heard. When she was sure they had fallen asleep, Monica opened her eyes and saw her parents hugging each other. She thought of the many lifetimes of cultivation it would take to exchange for such a beautiful love like her parents, which had lasted for decades. In the past, she did not know anything and only thought her father had no status in front of her mother. Only now did she understand that he doted on her very much. That was why he allowed her to do whatever she wanted in his world. Her mother must have been in God's good graces to be able to meet her father who loved her so much. A faint smile appeared, and a tear fell onto her lips. When did she start crying so much? As both her arms were wrapped in bandages, it was difficult for her to wipe her tears. Her eyes flickered. During her moment of sadness, Finn suddenly appeared in her ward. When Finn saw her face and their eyes met, he was clearly surprised. Not because of tears, but rather, Finn thought that she had fallen asleep. However, when he saw his tears, he looked a little lost. Monica was also in a daze for a while. She did not expect Finn to appear here. Furthermore, she did not want Finn to see her cry. 
She was afraid of being despised by this man. She raised her hand with great effort and wiped her tears with her bandaged hand. Finn looked on at her before shifting his gaze last minute. He probably did not want to see her like this. She asked, Are you here to see Sarah? Monica quickly regained her composure. While she was not very capable in this life, she had always been known to be heartless. Finn returned his gaze to her. I heard my mom say she was in the room next door, Monica told him. Finn remained silent. It's a good thing you saved her. Otherwise, she would have died inside with me, and her parents would probably not have let me off even if they turned into ghosts, Monica said with a faint smile. Her voice was very low, afraid she would wake her parents. She said, who would have thought that a wedding would end up like this? Though I heard that no guests died at the scene. Otherwise, I would have died 10,000 times today. Monica blamed herself for the wedding accident. It was not related to you, Finn said. He was trying to say that what happened at the wedding had nothing to do with her. If I hadn't gotten married, all these things wouldn't have happened. Monica, on the other hand, could see it clearly. You weren't injured, were you? Finn looked at her. Judging by your appearance, you should be fine, Monica said lightly. Hurry up and go keep Sarah company next door. I heard from my mother that Sarah was frightened badly. She probably needs someone to accompany her now. Monica urged him to leave. You didn't mind. Finn suddenly asked her instead of leaving. What? Monica was surprised. That I saved Sarah first, Finn said. Monica smiled. At first, she thought Finn had asked her if she did not mind him going to accompany Sarah. She was always giving herself hope, but it turns out that Finn was just a little uneasy with his conscience. If it were anyone else, they would probably feel a little uneasy as well. That was human nature, after all. She was not great herself either. Of course, she had grumbled about it. Even if she kept opening up new lands for Finn, it was difficult for her to be magnanimous in the face of life and death. She said, in that environment, I would have saved Sarah first if I were you. Finn's throat moved slightly, and he pursed his lips tightly. Of course, I'm a little resentful. After all, I almost died. However, humans are selfish creatures. It's normal they would choose to save those who were more important to them first. I'm selfish too. If I wasn't, I wouldn't have been so petty. Though, it ended quite well. I'm not dead, so I don't care too much. You don't have to feel too guilty. Finn looked at Monica's calm appearance as she spoke. She did not look too sad. It seemed she really had let go. They did not know what else to say, creating some awkwardness between the two. Monica had always thought Finn would immediately turn around and leave, but he did not go for a long time. Suddenly, the door was suddenly pushed open. Monica, how are you? It was her uncle, Ron. Monica turned her head and looked over, as did Finn. Ron was a little excited when he saw Finn. He quickly greeted him, Finn, you're here too. I was just about to look for you. Thank you so much. If it weren't for you, my Sarah might have. As parents, they found it hard to accept what had happened today. Uncle, Finn came to see Sarah and went to the wrong room. Why don't you take him there? Monica suggested. Sure. I'll bring Finn over now. I'll come over to accompany you in a while, Ron quickly said. No need. My parents are with me. I'm tired and would like to sleep for a while too. You should spend more time with Sarah and chat more with your future son-in-law, Monica joked. Ron glared at Monica dotingly. 
he could not help but feel a little gratified. After this incident, he and his wife would definitely not object to Finn and Sarah's relationship. They had felt a little awkward about it at first because of Monica. However, to see Monica so open-minded, he felt relieved. Ron said happily, have a good rest, then. I'll take you out for some good food once you feel better. All right. Monica nodded with a smile. Ron said to Finn, let's go. Finn turned around and glanced at Monica, a seemingly normal action. Then, he followed Ron and left her ward. Monica watched them as they left, the smile on her lips gradually fading. She had no time to hide away her sad emotions before she heard her mother's voice, who had probably woken up by the noise. She said, are you really letting go of Finn? Monica nodded. What else can I do except let go? I can't let myself live at a dead end for the rest of my life. Besides, with Finn's personality, whoever dates or marries him will be the unlucky one. So since I don't like Sarah, I'll just watch her be unlucky. You're so immature. Ruby was speechless at her daughter. Monica smiled. Mom, don't worry about me. I've been living a comfortable life with you and Dad. Anyway, you know I can't help you when it comes to love. So don't worry about it. If you have the time, why don't you go to the hospital with Dad for a checkup and see if you can give birth to a second child or something. Monica, are you itching for a beating? Ruby's face turned red at her daughter's words. Monica smiled brightly. Her mother, at her age, was blushing like a young girl. I'm going to sleep. Don't disturb me. Monica shifted her body and turned her back to them. As long as she did not expect much in life, she could actually be very happy. In fact, she had been content with her current lifestyle since she was young. In the next room. Sarah was a little excited when she saw Finn walking over. She said, you saved me in the banquet hall and left right after you put me down. I didn't know where you went and have been so worried. Were you hurt? No, Finn replied coldly. Have a good rest. Did you come here just to see me? Finn had yet to speak when Ron quickly said, of course. He even went to the wrong room to your cousin's side. I brought him over. Finn swallowed the words that were on the tip of his tongue. How is my cousin? Is her injury serious? It was a while after me before she came out. Was she severely burned? Sarah asked nervously. The doctor said it's a little more serious than yours, but she's in good spirits. She even joked with me just now. She's much stronger than you. Ron could not help but praise Monica. Sarah pouted. All right. Since Sarah is much younger than Monica, it's only natural she would be a little melodramatic and cannot take the pain, right? Look at you, talking about other people's good as a father. Could you, for once, not make Sarah sad? Yvonne said protectively. Ron's heart ached for his daughter, so he did not refute his wife's words. Finn did not participate in their conversation. He knew very well that Monica would cry and make a fuss even when she scraped her skin a little. At least, she used to. Now, it seemed she had changed a lot. Finn, sit. Yvonne quickly called out to Finn. She had previously disdained Finn for being too old and had been very opposed to him dating Sarah. Now that Finn saved Sarah from the fire, she could not go against Sarah's insistence and had compromised. Finn thanked her politely and said, Auntie, can I have a few words alone with Sarah? Of course. Yvonne smiled. We've all been through this before. We understand. It's just that, Yvonne was obviously still worried. Finn looked at her. 
Yvonne hesitated for a moment. For her daughter's sake, she decided to be honest. I've discussed with Sarah's father about you and Sarah dating, and we've agreed to it. However, Sarah's still young. She just turned 18 and hasn't even graduated from high school yet. We hope that you two won't affect Sarah's studies. The main thing is, I know that you'll definitely be intimate while dating, and... Mom! Sarah's face was completely red. Yvonne was also a little embarrassed, but she continued, I'm doing this for your own good. You're still so young. You cannot do adult things. I'm 18 years old. That means I'm an adult. You don't get to have to say about my matters anymore. You. Don't worry, Finn said with certainty. I won't do anything out of line with Sarah. Sarah was very upset. It was not easy to seduce Finn, to begin with. Now, her mother had done this to her. I'm relieved to hear you say that. It's only for a year. When Sarah goes to college, I won't care so much anymore, Yvonne said happily. Finn nodded. Then we'll head out first so you can talk it out. There's no hurry. We'll just be next door accompanying Monica. Yvonne quickly pulled Ron out. When she left, she even closed the door behind her. Only the two of them were left in the ward now. Sarah was still a little shy. She said, you don't have to take my mother's words to heart. I'm already 18. I'm here to tell you that what I said at the banquet today was untrue, Finn spoke bluntly. Sarah's face turned pale. Her eyes were red, and she looked at him in pain. Due to reasons I cannot disclose, I hope you can date me. I want people to think we're dating, Finn said straightforwardly. You mean we would pretend to be a couple? Sarah's tears rolled down her cheeks. Finn nodded, his voice still cold. If you're unwilling, I won't force you. Why are you doing this? Sarah asked. She did not understand why Finn was like this. Though, after today's incident, no matter how stupid she was, she realized that Finn was not simple at all. It seemed to have secrets that he could not let others know. I can't tell you. I can only promise to try my best to protect you and not let you get hurt because of me. Do you think that injuries are only superficial? Sarah said uncomfortably. The heartache was even more painful now. Then. I'm sorry for disturbing you, Sarah. Finn turned around and left. I'll do it. Sarah said suddenly and loudly. Finn pursed his lips. To him, confessing to Sarah in front of so many people would bring trouble if they were not together. The Sanders might even get a hold of it. So, even if he had to put on a pretense, he should at least do it for a while. At least, he should let people think that they were really dating. It would not take too long. Two to three months. Half a year at most. He said, let me be clear with you first. I won't develop feelings for you. Finn, you're not as cold as you appear to be. Sarah was certain. Why else would you rush into the fire to save me? Finn's throat moved slightly. There were some things he dared not say out loud. You came to save me, which means you aren't that indifferent to me. Finn, I will make you fall for me, Sarah said loudly as if she was making an oath. You won't, Finn said coldly. After all, she was not who he rushed into the fire for. Sarah's heart ached when she saw Finn's expression. However, as long as there was a glimmer of hope, she would not give up. She said, I'll be your girlfriend. It doesn't matter if it's real or fake. It won't be more than half a year. Finn had given her a time limit. All right, she said. Half a year it was. 
She believed that she would be able to save Finn in half a year. Back then, her cousin only had such a short period too. She did not think that she was worse than her cousin or that she loved Finn any less than her. One day, she would be with Finn. On a private jet in the sky above Southampton City. The assassins of the hills immediately retreated back to Delta Island. As there were no casualties in this incident, the number of people who came on this mission was the same as those who went back. Everyone had already taken off their human skin masks and wigs. Assassins did not talk much, so it was quiet on the plane. A female voice suddenly rang out. Jean, are you hurt? It was Melinda, asking her out of concern. Jean turned to look at her. I'm fine. That's good. I was afraid that you would be when I saw you suddenly rush into the fire. I thought Lucy would stop you, or else I would never have let you in, Melinda said deliberately. She had said it on purpose for Kingsley to hear. She knew very well that Kingsley was very angry at Jean for returning to the burning wedding hall without a care for her life. Jean's eyes turned cold. That's my decision. It has nothing to do with Lucy. That's true. Fortunately, you weren't injured. Otherwise, Melinda looked very worried. Mr. Hill would be very sad. Kingsley glanced at Melinda, and she quickly shut her mouth. Then, Lucy took the initiative to say, I didn't stop her. You seem to disobey me often. Kingsley's expression was cold. Don't think too highly of yourself. Understood, Lucy said respectfully. Jean really could not stand how Kingsley treated Lucy. She could not take it anymore and said, why didn't you say that she took herself too seriously when you slept with her? Kingsley's expression turned cold. Melinda quickly said, Jean, how can you say that about Mr. Hill? Lucy and I willingly slept with Mr. Hill. We're all members of the Hills. Once we enter the Hills, we're members for life. Since Mr. Hill's the head of the Hills, we're all naturally his. So, it's only right Mr. Hill gets to do what he wants with us. Jean sneered. Do you think you're some ancient king? Jean. Kingsley said coldly. I don't need you interfering in my matters. Then why are you interfering in mine? I went in to save Monica, my best friend. What right do you have to stop me? Lucy couldn't, so what right do you have to give her that attitude? Are you planning to return to Delta Island and throw Lucy into the dungeon to be tied up and abused again? Jean mocked. Kingsley looked at Jean coldly. The two of them had very strong auras. If Kingsley was a big tiger, ferocious and ruthless, Jean was definitely a cub. While the cub could not beat the big tiger, once it invaded the cub's territory, the cub could bite back. Due to the dispute between the two on the plane, the other assassins did not dare to even breathe. They were afraid of being implicated. After all, everyone knew that Kingsley could kill anyone without reason, but he would not touch a single hair on Jean's head. I'll say it again. I decided to go back and save Monica. If you punish Lucy because of this, I will blow up your manor in Delta Island. Jean looked determined. She understood Kingsley's methods all too well. Even though Lucy had helped her so much, Kingsley would definitely punish her since she did not listen to his orders. Kingsley's attacks had never been light either. Kingsley's expression was extremely unsightly. The two of them were now in a deadlock, and no one dared to take the bullet. Lucy did not dare to interrupt. From her perspective, it was wrong to help anyone. She could only watch the two of them explode in anger. The stalemate continued for a long time, and the atmosphere on the plane was suffocating. Melinda suddenly spoke. It was as if she was trying to change the topic. 
I saw that fourth master swan seemed to be injured today. No one paid attention to Melinda, but it broke the stalemate a little and gave Kingsley a way out. She continued, however, it was too dark, and I couldn't see clearly. Lucy, you should know. Lucy's face darkened. I think I saw you shooting fourth master swan when he trapped Jean, Melinda said. Right? Jean turned to look at Lucy. So Lucy had been the one who fired the bullet. She pursed her lips. Lucy did not try to defend herself. Melinda asked again, was it a hit? It was too dark, and I couldn't see clearly. It was as if she was forcing Lucy to admit it. Lucy responded. I noticed that fourth master swan's attention was always on Jean. It was indeed a good opportunity to make a move. Melinda continued to fan the flames. It was all to cause conflict between Lucy and Jean. It was clear Jean and Fourth Master Swan still had feelings for each other. Even if the two of them were on opposing sides, they could not bear to hurt one other. If Jean were to find out that Lucy wanted to kill Fourth Master Swan behind her back, there would definitely be a grudge between them. Melinda's biggest threat now was Lucy. She had observed her in death and realized that Kingsley treated Lucy differently from the others. If Lucy stayed by Kingsley's side a little longer and gained his favor, especially with Jean's protection of Lucy, Melinda's status in the hills would immediately plummet. Hence, she had to find a way to get rid of Lucy. Lucy looked at Melinda coldly. She knew her motive all too well. In front of everyone, she did not give Melinda any face and said bluntly, Melinda, it's not a good thing to be too eager for quick success. Melinda's face turned pale at Lucy's words. She had not expected Lucy to talk back to her in such a way. On the plane. Melinda was embarrassed by Lucy's words, but she smiled shakily and forced herself to look innocent. She said, I've always been a little too direct. I'm sorry if I've offended you in any way. Are you being too direct? Or are you deliberately trying to drive a wedge between us? Lucy glared at Melinda. You know very well what you're trying to do. How could you misunderstand my intentions so badly? How could I have such thoughts? At first, Melinda was a little embarrassed, but now, she looked as if she had been greatly wronged. Lucy, ever since I joined the Hills as an assassin, I've been loyal and regarded myself as a part of them. I only want the best for the Hills, so how did it become a provocation? What did I say today to piss you off? Was something I said not the truth? If any part of it was a lie, I will be struck by lightning. Melinda said, filled with righteous indignation. It was as if Lucy had wronged her. Lucy had been in the hills for a long time, and Melinda was a newcomer. The weakness Melinda currently showed was proof she was being bullied by Lucy. Even though what Melinda had said was a little repulsive, everything happened just as she said. She had not made anything up and was just telling the truth. However, being mocked by Lucy made people feel that Lucy was not magnanimous enough. It was also because she had a guilty conscience and was afraid of what others would say. Lucy looked at Melinda coldly and said, we're assassins. There's no need for assassins to talk so much nonsense. What nonsense did I just say? Melinda became even more agitated. I just... I just wanted to ease the tension between Mr. Hill and G&E. &E. I also wanted to make them less angry, so I found a topic to brush it off. Was that wrong of me? Lucy, could it be that you can't wait for Mr. Hill and Jean to fight because of you? Melinda. Lucy had always been calm, but she was starting to lose control because of Melinda's deliberate instigation. I'm not wrong. Melinda said firmly. Everything I've done is for the harmony of the hills. 
I won't stand you slandering me like this. The anger that Lucy had been holding back was slowly erupting. As assassins were usually quiet, this kind of war was very rare. When there was conflict, they would fight directly. The hills did not allow their assassins to kill each other. It was taboo. Looking at Lucy's expression, Melinda provoked her once more. Or did you do something shameful and are afraid others would say it out loud? Smack. Lucy gave Melinda a hard slap across her face. The sudden loud noise stunned all the assassins on the plane. Melinda also looked at Lucy in disbelief. She had not expected Lucy to hit her. Though, she smiled evilly in her heart. She had been trying to provoke Lucy. She knew very well that Kingsley could not stand an assassin doing whatever they wanted in front of him. Kingsley's authority was not to be violated. No one else in this world could do it except Jean. Lucy. That was why Kingsley had spoken at that moment. He had already been extremely angry and now looked downright terrifying. Have you forgotten who you are? Kingsley said coldly. I'm the only one who can touch the assassins of the hills. You can't just hit them as you please. You've challenged my limits again and again. Do you really think that I won't kill you? Lucy sneered. So, in Mr. Hill's mind, it's considered touching Monica when I hit her, but Melinda's mockery of me doesn't count as touching me. I wasn't mocking you. I was just telling you the truth. I didn't expect you to mind so much. Besides, I've been trying to explain my innocence because you're mocking me. Melinda explained hurriedly to make people think Lucy was bullying her on purpose. Assassins were not usually good at arguing, but Melinda was an anomaly. Previously, Lucy thought highly of her and let her sleep with Kingsley. Other than her good looks and figure, it was also because she was more talkative than most assassins. She thought she could please Kingsley, and she really did. Let me remind you again. Do not cross my bottom line. Kingsley looked at Lucy with an ugly expression. So, Mr. Hill, are you saying Melinda is your bottom line? Lucy. Otherwise, what's wrong with me protecting my legitimate rights and interests? I don't accept Melinda's personal attacks on me. Why can't I fight back? Lucy's uncontrollable emotions were also starting to explode. It's because you're just an assassin of the hills. Assassins only need to carry out orders unconditionally. What right do you have to talk to me about human rights? Do you think you have rights? Kingsley interrogated her. Lucy's eyes narrowed, staring straight at Kingsley. Just like that, she had been completely ridiculed by Kingsley. That's right. She had almost forgotten. She had been living so comfortably all these years that she almost forgot that assassins had no rights. So, there was no personal attack. In the hills, Kingsley had the final say. Whatever Kingsley said was true, and they would carry out whatever order Kingsley gave. From the moment they became assassins, they were to obey unconditionally. Lucy smiled coldly. It had been a long time since she lost control of herself. No matter how cruel Kingsley was to her, she endured it. Yet, because of one of Kingsley's women, she ended up in this state, being taught a lesson by Kingsley in front of so many assassins. In fact, she should not have any emotional fluctuations. After all, an assassin should not have emotions. All right. I understand. Lucy suddenly calmed down. Until today, she had never been impulsive and would treat today as a one-off. She said, from now on, whatever Melinda says is right. She would not refute, object, or lose her temper at her again since she had no right. Assassins were not qualified to do what they wanted, 
nor did they have their own thoughts. Kingsley's expression seemed to have become even uglier. He glared fiercely at Lucy and watched as her arrogance disappeared to look extremely calm in an instant. Lucy's irrational behavior had indeed angered him. However, now, Lucy's obedience made him feel an indescribable sense of depression. Lucy met Kingsley's gaze. It was obvious he was still in a great rage. She said, do I still have to apologize to Melinda? Should she apologize so he would not be so angry? She did not want him to kill her in a fit of anger. However, she did not get a response from Kingsley. I'm sorry, Lucy said to Melinda. All the assassins were a little surprised. No matter how incompetent Lucy was, she had followed Kingsley for many years and was trusted by him. Apart from Kingsley, Lucy was the one in charge of the hills. Lucy had always helped Kingsley arrange many things for the hills, so many assassins had already determined Lucy as the hills' female head. Of course, Lucy could not be compared to Jean, but Jean was a member of the hills. Lucy was the only assassin who had managed to get to her current position, which made many envious and admiring of her. However, had the sky changed? Had the killer, Melinda, who was at the start of her career, replaced Lucy's existence? The assassins thought to themselves. While this group of people was fighting with their lives, it was only natural that they would still have their own little thoughts in order to live a better life. Lucy's apology made Melinda happy. Lucy's low stance in front of so many assassins meant that her status was beneath Melinda's. Now, all of them would have to be respectful to her. This had been her goal. The first step was to remove Lucy's identity completely, and the second was to find a way to get rid of her during a mission. She had long understood the operations of the hills. Many of the tasks were not arranged by Kingsley himself. Previously, Lucy had helped Kingsley. Now that she had replaced Lucy, soon, she would have great power. Once she could arrange for assassins to go on missions, it would be easy for her to kill Lucy. Melinda's expression was hard to hide. At that moment, it seemed as if she was magnanimously forgiving Lucy. She said, I might have been too direct with my words. I'll be more careful in the future. Lucy did not reply, and Kingsley did not say another word. When the plane landed on Delta Island, all assassins went back to their places. Melinda remained by Kingsley's side while Lucy returned to her room. Lucy turned to look at Jean as she walked into Lucy's room. Jean said, I think you were a little irrational when you dealt with Melinda's matter. Jean had not said a word on the plane. This was not because she did not want to help Lucy but because she wanted to see Lucy's attitude toward Melinda. To be honest, she had never taken little Melinda seriously. She did not think this woman would influence Lucy's image in the hills, nor Kingsley's heart. However, Lucy had let Melinda have her way. I'm tired, Lucy said. She was tired of Kingsley. So, you're just going to let Melinda do whatever she wants. Jean said. Isn't that your uncle's choice? Lucy said sarcastically. In Jean's opinion, Kingsley was only angry because Lucy fell for Melinda's trick. Kingsley was a cunning old fox. There was no way he could not see through Melinda's thoughts. Though he had been helping Melinda because Lucy had indeed crossed the line. Some rules and principles could not be violated in the hills, and killing assassins was intolerable in the hills. Moreover, Kingsley also needed to have prestige. This was another reason why Jean chose to remain silent regarding Lucy and Melinda. Everyone knew she was Kingsley's niece. So she could throw away her identity as an assassin and behave atrociously with him, and no one would feel as if Kingsley's power was threatened. However, Lucy could not do that. She was an assassin, 
and an assassin would never have the right to disobey Kingsley and the Hills. The Hills had to have absolute control over them, and she would not disregard Kingsley's status to protect Lucy. She also had her own selfish motives. In the end, Kingsley was her uncle, and she would not do anything to threaten him. However, she did not want to see Lucy put up with Melinda. It was obvious Melinda did not have Lucy's breadth of mind, nor did not look at the bigger picture. If she stayed by Kingsley's side, it would be easy for her to ruin the Hill's plans for personal reasons. Even though Kingsley would not let Melinda be, she selfishly felt that Lucy was more suitable for him. Moreover, she had a feeling that Kingsley wanted Lucy to return to his side. However, Kingsley was still Kingsley, and as the head of the Hills, his identity and status mattered. He could not put any assassins in a short position. Thus, Lucy had to take the initiative. If not, Kingsley would never ask her to return to his side. This was the conflict between the two of them. Now, she finally understood what Melinda was trying to do and needed to help Kingsley. Even if Kingsley's actions at times were truly chilling. I don't think you should suffer like this, Jean said. Melinda shouldn't be your match. So what do you think I should do? Take the initiative to express my goodwill to Kingsley. Lucy sneered. Kingsley would never have feelings for any woman. He can't, but can you? Do you have feelings for any man? Jean retorted. Lucy's eyes flickered. You never know when you're going to die in the hills, Jean said indifferently. Who can really devote their feelings to another? In fact, there have been feelings between assassins. However, in all these years, no assassin in the hills has made a mistake because of it. Everyone knows that in the face of life and death, feelings are worthless. What are you trying to say? Lucy looked at Jean. Jean said, I'm just telling you that we're all living on the edge. That's a fact no one can change. Rather than sulking until death, it's better to let oneself live a more comfortable life. To put it bluntly, just because you put up with Melinda doesn't mean she will do the same with you. I think we both know what kind of person she is after spending so much time together. Do you really want to be played to death by her? Lucy's expression was clearly a little ugly. Are you willing to be played to death by Melinda? Jean asked. So you think I should resist? What you did on the plane just now was not resist Melinda but provoke Kingsley on purpose. You were being emotional. While I don't want you to fall in love with Kingsley, because there won't be any results, I don't want you to give up on yourself either. If you remove the emotional component, you can make your life in the hills better, Jean said bluntly. Why won't you let yourself live a better life? Is it because you like him? Lucy did not refute. Is it because you realized that you've fallen in love, so you started to distance yourself from Kingsley? Lucy still chose to remain silent. There's no need for that, Jean said. Other than Kingsley, you can't love like an ordinary person. Why are you making your life so difficult for yourself? Lucy looked at Jean. She seemed to have been convinced by her. Think about it, Jean said. In any case, she was only suggesting, and whether or not Lucy would listen was her choice. She would not force Lucy. Even though she hoped Lucy would return to Kingsley's side, she would respect her decision, regardless. Lucy did not answer Jean immediately. Perhaps she was hesitant. After all, Kingsley was indeed not a good person. If she wanted to stay by his side and be magnanimous, she needed to be mentally prepared. Jean did not make things difficult for Lucy and immediately changed the topic. Do you want me to help you deal with the burn wounds on your body? Lucy had accompanied her into the banquet hall during the fire. As she was clearing the way for Jean, the burns on her body were more serious. 
Lucy came back to her senses. She said, it's not serious. For an assassin, a wound like that was nothing. If it was serious, she could only bear it. Even though everyone saw that Lucy had many burns on her body, none of the assassins really cared. Death was just a word. Lie down, Jean said. It might be nothing to Lucy, but to her, it was a part of their friendship, and she wanted to return the favor. Lucy looked at Jean and asked, aren't you going to blame me? For what? I shot fourth Master Swan behind your back, Lucy exposed. Melinda wasn't lying. I was unhappy for a second, Jean admitted. Lucy was well aware of her relationship with Edward, and she thought she could trust Lucy completely. However, once she thought it through, she realized. Was it an order from Kingsley? She asked. Lucy nodded. He knew very well that you wouldn't be able to go through with it. That's why I didn't blame you. Even Kingsley has no reason to blame me. Everything Kingsley did was for my sake. He was afraid that if I didn't kill Edward, Edward would kill me. Jean said calmly. She had known about this for a while and was not too emotional. Lucy nodded and did not say anything else. Furthermore, if you really wanted to kill Edward, you would not have hurt his thigh, Jean laughed. It was just to report to Kingsley, right? Yeah. So what can I complain about? Lucy did not say anything else. Assassins rarely stirred up emotions. It was not just unspoken. Some feelings were indeed much weaker than the average person. I'll help you treat your wound, Jean said. No need. Let the doctor handle it. You don't trust me. Jean raised her eyebrows. It's not that. The wound will leave a mark, and I want to get rid of it. Lucy kept talking. I thought you didn't care about the scars on your body anymore. Last time I saw, you had a lot of scars on your body, Jean teased. I'll follow your suggestion, Lucy suddenly said. Jean was surprised for a second. I can't let that little bee asterisk TCH Melinda play with me until I'm dead. The corners of Lucy's mouth lifted slightly. Every time Lucy laughed, it was full of charm. As a 32-year-old woman, she knew what a man wanted better than a woman in her 20s, especially in bed. I can't wait to see what you do. Jean's face was full of anticipation. I'll call the doctor for you, then. Thank you, she said. Jean left the room, asking the servant to get the doctor before returning to her room. She laid on the bed, thinking of Edward. She thought of George and Monica as well. She did not know how long such days would last. In the end, would she really get what she hoped for? Southampton City. Monica and Sarah were discharged a week later. Their burn wounds were much better, but the skin was still tender and could not be touched. Other than that, they were fine. After she was discharged, Sarah did not go home but went straight to Monica's house. Ruby was worried about Sarah's parents taking care of her. After all, Sarah's parents were busy with work. Since Ruby was staying at home full-time and taking care of Monica, it was no trouble for her to take care of another two. So Sarah happily followed Monica's family back to their house. Monica had disliked Sarah since she was young. Every time she was around, she would be chided by her parents. Now, Monica had all the more reason not to like her. She actually tried to steal her man and was, more importantly, successful. Monica counted all the times over the years she had been humiliated in front of Sarah, and the more she thought about it, the angrier she got. Sarah got what she wanted every time. F asterisk CK. She must have owed this woman something in her past life and was here to collect her debt. Monica laid on her bed, 
feeling uneasy. She was so bored. Over the past week, the news of her wedding had been trending. Breaking off her engagement on the spot, exposing Michael's true colors, and then a fire. It was huge news. Even the Sanders came forward to explain the various incidents which happened during the wedding. As she was so bored, Monica had read all the news about her wedding banquet. In addition to paying attention to the incident, most of the onlookers were still filled with righteous indignation at Michael's hypocritical image. The internet was full of Michael's scolding, including Ruby. Monica could not bear to read those vicious words. Even though she had expected such a result, she still felt it was a big blow to Michael. Her guilt was even more obvious, especially on the third day after the wedding banquet, when the news of Michael being dismissed from his position as the head of the quality inspection hall spread like wildfire. However, she had no regrets or empathy toward him. It was self-defense. The consequences were Michael's responsibility to bear, not hers. Michael had not called her these past few days. She did not know what Michael was thinking or if he had given up struggling. In Monica's world, she and Michael had nothing to do with each other anymore. How Michael lived in the future was his business. She would just live out the rest of her years and let herself live well. She thought how ordinary life would be now that Michael, Finn, nor Jean was no longer by her side. She was prepared to stay home and accompany her parents for the rest of her life until something happened. The day went by as usual, with Ruby taking care of Monica and Sarah's daily needs. It had been a week since they had returned from the hospital. Monica felt she had put on a lot of weight from staying home every day, waiting for death. Sarah said she did not look good if she put on weight, but she still could not refuse Ruby's meticulous meal. The two of them complained as they swept the floor. Facing the empty plates, Monica and Sarah were both a little sad. Why aren't you back in school yet? Monica looked at Sarah unhappily. She had almost recovered, so why was she not at school? Was senior year that easy? If Sarah were not around, she probably would not have been able to eat so much. The doctor told me to rest at home for two weeks before going to school. I have to go to the hospital for a checkup too, Sarah retorted. You don't want to go to college, do you? I'm not going to college. I'm going to nursing school, Sarah said bluntly. Monica was a little surprised. Aren't you afraid of what your parents might say? Back then, Monica's grades were not good. In order not to be beaten to death by her parents, she worked hard during her final year. After that, she received an average bachelor's degree, which was considered next to nothing. Sarah was even more ambitious than her. I'm going to be a nurse. I've already set my sights on that major, Sarah quickly said. I've asked my teacher. My grades are more than enough to get in, so don't worry. Why do you want to be a nurse? Monica really could not understand Sarah. She was a well-bred young lady and had to serve others. For Finn, of course, Sarah said happily. Monica also reacted. F asterisk CK. She had dug her own grave, touching her own sore spot. Monica suddenly stopped talking. On the contrary, Sarah was in high spirits. Once I become a nurse, I can always be with Finn, no matter if I'm at or off work. How great would that be? Haha, <laughs> Monica sneered. You will know how amazing Finn really is once you live with him in the future. It could anger someone to death. She could not wait for the day Sarah received her retribution. Speaking of which, I haven't sent a message to Finn today. I'm going to report to him about my recovery. With that, she got off the table and ran off excitedly. Monica just looked at Sarah's figure. It was as if she was looking at her past self. 
She was no longer interested in doing anything now. She got off the table slowly, and the servants came forward to clean up the table. Ruby was lying on the sofa watching TV. Every time she cooked, she would not eat much herself, choosing to try her best to let Monica and Sarah eat. Monica always felt that her mother was trying deliberately to fatten them up so she could accentuate her slim figure. This old lady was too evil. Monica sat down next to her mother, but before she could speak, her mother's phone rang. Ruby glanced at it and picked it up. Hello. It was probably a stranger. Madam, something bad happened. The chairman had a heart attack and suddenly fainted. An agitated voice came through from the other end. Ruby's expression changed and became a little dazed. What's wrong? Monica quickly asked, having noticed her mother's strange behavior. It was only then that Ruby seemed to have realized something and reacted. She said, your father had a heart attack and fainted. What? Monica was shocked. She hurriedly said to her mother, hurry. Send him to the hospital. The other party was already saying, we've already called the ambulance, and they'll be here soon. Please come to the hospital as quickly as you can. There was no time to ask what had happened. Ruby quickly got up from the sofa and rushed to the hospital with Monica tagging along. Just as they were leaving, Sarah came downstairs with her phone. When she saw their panicked looks, she quickly chased after them. Auntie, what's wrong? Your uncle had a heart attack. Your cousin and I have to rush to the hospital right now. Take good care of yourself at home, okay? Ruby anxiously instructed while waiting for the car. Uncle fainted. Sarah seemed to be in disbelief. She quickly said, I want to go with you to see uncle. The car was already parked in front of them. To not waste any more time, she nodded in agreement. Sarah, Ruby, and Monica got into the car. The atmosphere in the car was very tense. No one knew how serious Gary's condition was. Ever since he had a heart bypass surgery, he never had a relapse. The consequences of one were unimaginable. Monica suddenly thought of something and hurriedly picked up her phone to call Finn. Since he was her father's attending doctor, she had to inform him as soon as possible. Monica called twice, but Finn did not pick up. She gritted her teeth. Sarah, give Finn a call. He might not pick mine up. After all, they had no relationship anymore. Finn might automatically ignore her when he saw her phone number. All right. Sarah quickly agreed. She gave Finn a call. The phone rang for a long time before Sarah said, he didn't pick up. Monica did know how she felt at that moment. Should she be glad that Finn had not deliberately ignored her call? Though, she hoped that was the case. That way, she could at least find him. Let me call the emergency number. Monica hurriedly dialed. The call went through quickly. Hello, this is. My father had a relapse of his heart disease. We've informed your ambulance to send him to the hospital, but I can't seem to contact his main doctor, Finn, right now. Please help us make arrangements. My father will arrive at the hospital in about 15 minutes. Please be sure to inform him to rescue my father. All right. I'll arrange it for you immediately, the other party hurriedly said. Thank you, she said and hung up the phone. Even after, she was still a little worried. Ruby and Sarah were also a little restless. The ambulance was two minutes until arrival when the car finally arrived at the hospital, so the three of them waited at the door. However, Finn was not there. She could not help but call the hospital's emergency number again. Dr. Jones's operation is about to end. 
We've already informed his assistant, and he'll come over as soon as it's over. We've also arranged for other doctors from the cardiology department to perform any emergency response first. Please don't worry. She was still not at ease, though. Finally, the ambulance arrived, and Gary was carried out of the ambulance. Monica, as well as all the waiting doctors and nurses, hurried over. Gary's face was green, and he looked very serious. Ruby was so scared that tears came out of her eyes. Dear, what's wrong? Don't scare me. Please don't scare me. Please calm down and step aside. We need to send him for emergency treatment immediately. The medical staff quickly pushed Ruby away, who was in their way. Monica went over and hugged Ruby. Mom, Dad's going to be fine. Don't cry. Let's listen to the doctor. Ruby forced herself to calm down. The three followed the doctors and nurses and quickly rushed to the emergency room. Not long after Gary was pushed in, another set of footsteps could be heard in the corridor. Everyone turned their heads. They hurried over when they saw it was Finn, who was still in a surgical gown. Without thinking, Monica rushed over, grabbing Finn's clothes, my dad. Finn suddenly raised his hand and pushed Monica away, leaving Monica embarrassed for a second. She really had not meant to touch Finn just now. She said, please save my father. Finn only walked directly into the operating room. Outside the operating room, Ruby, Monica, Sarah, as well as his father's assistant, who had come with the ambulance, were all waiting nervously. The corridor was silent. It was as if anyone who made a sound would disturb the operation inside. The atmosphere was so suppressed that no one even dared to breathe too loudly. Monica turned to look at her mother. Ruby, who had always been strong in front of her, was now crying silently. She used to think that her father loved her mother more, but she knew now that the feelings had always been mutual. How far could a person's love go? She reached out and held her mother's hand tightly in her palm. Ruby looked at Monica with teary eyes and leaned her on her shoulder. It was true. She really needed someone to rely on. She was afraid that something would happen during the surgery. The operation took a long time. So long that the people waiting outside began to feel uneasy. They were also telling themselves not to be impulsive. As long as the operation was still in progress, Gary would at least still be alive. Finally, after a long wait, the light in the operating room went out. Ruby's body trembled at the sight. She looked forward to the end of the surgery but was also afraid that it meant bad news. Monica knew this feeling well. She was also frightened. Her body was stiff. She was afraid. No. He would not. Her father would be fine. The door of the operating room opened, and Finn walked out. Sarah and Gary's assistant hurried over while Ruby and Monica sat there motionlessly as if they had been petrified. All Monica did was stare at Finn. Sarah grabbed Finn's hand and asked excitedly, Finn, is my uncle all right? How is he? Finn pushed Sarah's hand away. However, it was not like how he treated Monica just now. As if he had been contaminated by something unclean, and his rejection very obvious. He was much gentler towards Sarah. Ruby looked at Finn as he walked to her, clearly frightened. Her eyes were red, and her body was trembling. Gary. Auntie, Finn said. Uncle's life is not in danger for the time being. Ruby cried even harder. She was moved to tears by the news. However, Finn suddenly paused, and everyone's mood tensed up again. Uncle is not showing any signs of waking up. His heart disease caused atrial fibrillation. 
The thrombosis in his heart caused complications, and the shedding of it circulated to the brain, causing cerebral thrombosis. He just underwent emergency treatment during the operation, and his life isn't in danger for the time being. However, if he continues to stay unconscious, there can only be two outcomes, Finn said. One, he becomes a vegetable. Second, if he wakes up, the lower half of his body will be paralyzed. Ruby's tears fell crazily, and Monica's heart broke down when she heard this. Sarah was also crying her eyes out. T then, what do we do? We'll send Uncle back to his ward first. Then, Auntie and Monica will try to wake him up, Finn said. If he wakes up today, the probability that his body will be able to recover from this will be high, and the above results may be avoided. However, if he does not wake up today, it'll be hard to predict what will happen. How could this be? Ruby murmured. Even Gary's first heart attack was not this serious. He managed to survive the first time. How could it be? At this moment, Gary was pushed out of the operating room. Ruby hurried over, excited and sad at the same time. However, as soon as she got up, she fell back on steadily. Monica hurriedly went to support her, as did Finn. Then, Monica's hand accidentally touched Finn's hand, but she was quick to let go. She was afraid of touching any part of his body. Monica did not want to cause any conflict with Finn, nor dare to even offend him. Her entire family's hope was on him now. The hope that Finn could save her father. Finn did not seem to notice Monica's reaction. He revealed no expression and said, Auntie, your health is the most important right now. If you collapse, it will be really difficult for uncle to wake up. Ruby forced herself to nod. She steadied her body and walked to Gary, who had just come out of the operating room. Monica, who had been trailing behind her mother, saw her father's pale face was pale. She looked at him. His eyes closed with no reaction to the outside world. What if he never woke up? Monica's eyes reddened, and her vision blurred at the thought of it. They followed the medical staff as they pushed Gary to the ward. Finn looked at their figures and could not help but tighten his hand that had just supported Ruby. In the ward, the doctors and nurses placed Gary on the bed, where various devices were monitoring Gary's physical condition. The doctors, nurses, and even Finn had left. Now, only a few of them remained. Ruby stayed silently by Gary's side with Monica and Sarah, their eyes red and swollen. Gary's assistant did not leave either. He was also waiting anxiously. Mom, talk to Dad. Tell him not to sleep. Monica could not help but say. Finn had told them to try and wake her father up, and he had to awaken today. Ruby nodded. She suppressed the pain in her heart and said, Dear, wake up. Gary did not react at all. If you don't wake up, what will happen to me, Monica, and our family? We can't live without you. Ruby's tears fell once more. She did not dare to get too excited. However, she could not control the sadness in her heart. Dear, I've been married to you for 28 years. When we got married, you said that you would take care of me for the rest of my life. Now, my life hasn't ended yet. How could you? How could you go back on your word? How could you just collapse like that? Monica felt that perhaps they should not be in the room while her mother was this way. So she said to Sarah and the assistant, let's head out first. The three of them left the room and waited outside. Cousin, I'm really worried about uncle. Auntie loves him so much. If uncle, Sarah's tears fell. Monica knew. She was also very afraid. She was afraid her father would succumb to his illness and her mother would not be able to support herself. 
No. Her father would wake up. The assistant, Mr. Warren, suddenly sighed. Monica and Sarah both looked at him. He looked back at them and said helplessly, if it weren't for the incident today, the chairman would never have had a heart attack and a stroke. What happened? Monica asked. Only then did she find out why her father had a heart attack. This morning, the chairman was in a high-level meeting introducing our new product to the market. He was discussing which hospitals should pilot it for free when the door of the meeting room suddenly pushed open. An employee came with the bad news that a batch of children's vaccines we produced had problems and had already killed a child. When the chairman heard the news, he didn't have time to instruct how to deal with it before he collapsed. Mr. Warren recalled the situation of her father fainting in the morning and felt a little uncomfortable. How could there be a problem? Hasn't our medicine always been safe? It goes through multiple tests before trial, and the production process is strictly followed. In terms of quality inspection, my dad has always been very strict. So how could there be a problem with the vaccine? Monica could not believe that such a medical mishap would happen in Cardellini Medical Technology. She had worked at the company with her father before and observed the production process of medications. The production was so harsh that such an accident could not have happened. Yeah. We also thought it strange. Our drug production is famous for being standardized, so it's impossible for there to be a problem with the vaccine. Though now, there's an accident. Mr. Warren seemed helpless and a little out of his wits. Could it be a normal rejection phenomenon? Some children have a certain probability of rejection towards vaccines, Monica asked. I'm not sure about the exact situation yet, as I sent the chairman directly to the hospital, Steve replied. There shouldn't be a problem with our vaccine. Monica was certain her father would never cut corners in the production of the drugs. Though, my father is not someone who has never seen the world. Why would he have a heart attack because of such an incident? That's because the chairman has been working overtime for a long time. Steve said, when we launched our new product, Sunny Pharmaceuticals also launched new affordable drugs at the same time. It's basically the same as our companies. It was even launched on the market a week ago and received the favor of many hospitals. The chairman spent a lot of time on this matter and has been working more than 12 hours a day to discuss the launch of the new drug with us. This has been going on for many days. Today, just as we were about to decide on the final plan, we were shocked to learn that he fainted. At first, I thought it was caused by overwork, but I didn't expect it to be so serious. Monica bit her lip. She did not expect her father's condition to suddenly become so serious. Her father had not pushed himself for many years, but every time he was at work, he was still more nervous than anyone else. Suddenly, she felt that she had cared too little for her father. He was not young anymore, and his body could not support his high-pressure work environment and long work hours, but she had never thought of sharing her father's burden. As long as her father was well, she would definitely try her hardest with working in the company. Uncle Warren, you don't have to stay. The company is definitely in need of people now that my dad is down. Also, be careful not to tire yourself out. Monica quickly said. Steve looked around the ward and could only nod. Okay. While the chairman is in a coma, I'll try my best to help the chairman take care of the company. But if the chairman doesn't wake up, the release of our new product will be delayed. It's fine. My dad's health is more important right now. We just have to run the company accordingly. We'll talk about it when my dad wakes up. All right. Steve nodded. With that, he left the ward. Monica and Sarah waited at the door for a long time. Monica said to Sarah, 
go to Finn's office and ask how serious my father's condition is. I'm worried he didn't tell my mom the worst case scenario for fear that she won't be able to accept it. Alright, Sarah quickly agreed. Monica looked at Sarah's back and felt an inexplicable bitterness in her heart. She had never thought that one day, she and Finn would be so far apart, so much that she had someone else to pass on the message. Monica was sitting alone outside the ward, not knowing what would happen to her father in the end. She was really scared, but she did not dare to show it as she was afraid that her mother would be even more afraid. Yet now, she really could not control her emotions. At the thought that her father might be bedridden for a long time, there was a hint of craziness in her eyes. She had always thought that she was very lucky. When did that luck start to drift away from her? After a while, Sarah and Finn appeared at the entrance of the ward. Finn had already changed out of his surgical gown and put on his clean white coat. Monica wiped her tears and stood up from the chair by the door. She looked at Finn respectfully and was very afraid of offending him. Finn glanced at Monica and said bluntly, I've told you about uncle's worst case scenario. Right now, his life is not in danger. He was probably answering the question she asked Sarah to ask. All right, Monica responded. After that, Finn pushed open the door of the ward, only to see Ruby lying beside Gary and her eyes swollen from crying. Monica's heart ached. However, she did not know how to comfort her mother. Finn walked over and checked Gary's condition. Slowly, he said, there's still no sign of him waking up, but don't give up. We still have one more night. He was comforting Ruby, who nodded mechanically. However, at that moment, she was really disheartened. She really felt like Gary was going to sleep for the rest of his life. Monica can give it a try too. Finn said, daughters can also have a certain effect. Finn told her what to do without looking at her. Yes. Monica hurriedly nodded. I'll be on duty in the office today, so if you need anything, you can press the call button to look for me. This button will allow you to talk to me directly, Finn explained. As it was a special VIP ward, the equipment was almost the same as the intensive care unit, but the facilities inside were more complete. All right, Monica agreed. Finn left the ward after leaving his instructions. In the ward, Ruby was still crying. Mom, don't cry. Dad will feel terrible if you do. Monica suppressed her emotions and comforted her mother. If he feels terrible about it, he should wake up. He should wake up, Ruby was on the verge of a mental breakdown and was finding it hard to calm down. Monica did not know what to say. He knows how important he is to me, but he's still asleep. Monica. I'm really scared that this will be it for your father. Ruby was heartbroken. Only when she was extremely sad would she show all her vulnerability. Monica hugged Ruby. Mom, it won't happen. Dad will definitely wake up. Finn said that we still have one more night. We can wake him up. Ruby against Monica and cried painfully. However, not many miracles existed in the world. That night, they called out to Gary for the entire night, but he still did not wake up. He just lay on the bed without any reaction. He did not even have an expression on his face. Ruby passed out from crying and Monica quickly told Sarah to inform Finn. Finn immediately rushed to the ward and did a physical examination on Ruby. After confirming that she had just fallen asleep due to excessive sadness, he told Ruby to rest. After all, Ruby was already 50 years old, and her body could not withstand the torment of staying up a whole day and night. Moreover, in situations where one was really sad, Fainting was also a way to calm them down and give them some rest. 
Once Monica was certain that her mother was fine, Monica thanked Finn. Finn did not reply, and Monica did not react to it as well. In fact, when she saw how dedicated Finn was to save her father, she was already so grateful that she did not dare to make any requests of him. Even though Finn's professional ethics might be the same for any of his patients, she was still grateful. Monica, what should we do? Aunt has fainted, but uncle is still unconscious. Sarah asked worriedly. It was already 6 a.m. in the morning. Finn said that if her dad did not wake up before 8 a.m., his chances of waking up would be slim. That meant there were only two hours left. Even so, she did not want to give up. She said, Sarah, you should get some sleep too. Sarah shook her head. No, I want to stay with all of you. That night, Sarah almost fell asleep a few times. Be good. If you faint, I'll have to take care of you too. Monica's tone was a little serious. But... I really want to stay with you. I'm talking to my dad. Monica said, I'm afraid I won't be able to say it with you around. Sarah looked at Monica in a daze. Let's go to my lounge. Finn suddenly said. At that moment, Finn did not leave immediately after checking on her mother's condition. Sarah turned to look at Finn in disbelief. There's not enough room for you to sleep here, Finn said. There was only one accompanying bed in the high-class ward. Although there was also a sofa, and it was fine for her to squeeze in, who would want his girlfriend to sleep like that? Finn had changed. Monica remembered that she used to come to Finn's office to look for him from time to time, especially when her father was undergoing a physical examination and she was the one who accompanied him. Occasionally, when she got bored from waiting, she would also want to go to the private lounge in Finn's office to lie down for a while. However, Finn would chase her out every time. It was no doubt that he treated Sarah differently. She felt Finn and Sarah leave and did not turn to look at them as they left because she was afraid that she would be sad. She had to let him go even though she was still a little sad. Her eyes moved slightly as she looked at her father lying on the bed as if he was dead. His face was pale and his body was motionless. Dad, Monica called out to him in a very gentle voice. I haven't told you, have I? I actually love you very much. Monica said with tears in her eyes, when I was young, I was a naughty child and would always make you unhappy. Every time I made a mistake, you would be so angry that you would glare at me. But every time, you still couldn't bear to hit or scold me. As long as I cried, you would lose all your principles. Whether it was my rebellious behavior or my stubbornness in love when I grew up, I have done many things that hurt you and my mother, but you still love me unconditionally and selflessly. I really don't know what I did in my past life to deserve the best parents in the world.